Let's first start with the business of sport. Uh, if there's one thing we have to admit nowadays, that is that uh, money is the basis of sport. Whether we like to, uh, to live with that axiom or not, most of professional athletes cannot uh, achieve any um, significant results without uh, financial backing. That's why nowadays we talk about the love-hate relationship between money and sports because whether people like to admit it or not, we cannot live without uh, money supporting our sports activities. There's two main trends in the sports industry today that we have to be aware of. The first one is commodification and the second one is professionalization. What does commodification actually mean? It means that sport has become a commodity. We treat it as goods that can be bought and sold. We talk about supply and demand, and we talk about a lot of financial parameters that maybe a century or so ago were simply uh, non-factors in sports, and sports were never actually referred to as the business of sports. Professionalization, as the second main trend, refers to the to the main occurrence of people becoming professionals in sports and actually uh, using sports as uh, the main uh, income or channel of income that they generate in order to be able to support themselves. So we're talking about professional sports league, beat uh, baseball, basketball, uh, water polo, and so on and so forth. So people are increasingly uh, choosing careers in sports because they have uh, realized that they, they can support themselves fully, not only themselves, but the entire infrastructure behind them by being top performers in sports. However, um, sport has also become an instrument for creating personal meaning because it's become increasingly important to us to recognize ourselves as creatures of sport, as people who, uh, who work on their bodies and are well aware of, of sports health benefits, as well as cultural identity, where we recognize ourselves as part of a group, uh, of, of a group of people who practice the same uh, sports, or as a channel for lucrative careers where uh, people can actually become not only recognized, but also very uh, financially well, uh, well off by simply choosing uh, a path that can make them the, the best in a specific sport discipline and recognized uh, on a global scale. Nowadays, there's three main sport finance hubs that we can talk about. The biggest one is still in the U.S., the second biggest one is Europe, and it's growing uh, by the year, especially in disciplines such as football, which are becoming increasingly professionalized and are drawing uh, cash and financial backing from sponsor, uh, sponsors well outside of European boundaries, whereas the third and the smallest hub at this point is the Far East, especially Japan and China. However, it is these markets that show the greatest uh, growth potential because this is where the next big uh, thing will happen in sports. Unfortunately, nobody's talking about Africa, the forgotten continent, where uh, some huge sport names have come from. If there's one thing you should remember from this course, it is that financial literacy is key to your success, not as an athlete, but as a well-rounded uh, being, especially one who tries to, to make a living off of their sports career. Uh, the sad thing to find out is that um, financial literacy is especially low among athletes and among sport administrators. The most common feature of modern sport management is the very limited level of knowledge and skills as well as experience in finance and funding that sport administrators and athletes show at the beginning of their careers. And the reason for you attending this um, course is exactly that, to improve your knowledge and become much better in managing your finances. Uh, in the past, and that is to say the not so recent past, finance has become a task for management. Uh, why? Because it allows you to keep um, accurate financial records, create um, and construct realistic budgets, 
monitor expenses and revenues, ensure adequate cash flows, create income generating uh, assets, which is especially important in the business of sports, and control debt levels. And uh, some or parts of these uh, issues will be covered in this financial uh, module. Poor financial management has very high costs and you should be aware of that. First and foremost, uh, the biggest threat is the, lost, the loss of control of the sports club or of the sports organization in terms of management control. Second of all, if you don't have good financial management practices, you will not be able to accurately measure performance, especially financial performance at the end of the year. And at this point, we really have to start talking about uh, what makes a club su successful. Is that uh, something in terms of sports success, showing trophies and uh, the first or the second place at the league uh, at the end of the year, or showing a healthy financial um, bottom line in terms of profits at the end of the year. So a lot of times one comes with the other, but sometimes you have to choose and you have to be able to determine what is the best course of action in terms of finance for your sports club or even your sports career. As I said, the costs of poor financial management are many. Some of them are falling asset values in terms of your, uh, your real estate, in terms of your players, in terms of your brand name. Then, increasing levels of debt if you're not generating enough cash and you have to uh, go to the bank to, to take out a loan in, over, in order to be able to service your debt uh, in the short term. Escalating costs if you have players who keep uh, asking for higher salaries. Lack of cash if you weren't able to, to plan according to your liquidity. Operating losses and especially the threat of liquidation. One of the best cases in point uh, in the most recent past was probably the case of Varda, the European handball champions of 2019, who despite their enormous success at the European level, uh, were actually um, facing bankruptcy right before the, the final match as most of the players did not receive at least nine months of their salaries and they still played without any financial backing. Nevertheless, they won, but at what cost? Uh, the club is not yet uh, certain whether it will continue to exist, but it went out with a bank. If you're not part of a very uh, financially powerful sports such as football, most of your options will be like these. You will either be a very successful sport club without any financial backing or you will have to start putting some management procedures in place in order to be able to ensure the survival of your club or your sports discipline. Let's go over some uh, statistics. Uh, most of the statistics are accurately measured in the US, so this is uh, the example that we will take. But consider this, a professional athlete's career does not last for longer than three years. And we're talking about, um, about American football, for instance, where, uh, which is a very powerful, financially powerful sport. So if the average career lasts for three years and you had been prepared or been preparing to achieve this um, summit of your career for your entire life, you're really not left with a lot. You only have three years to make enough of a living to be able to continue forward even uh, past your, uh, your top sport stakes. What is the biggest problem here? Most of the players, that is 78% of them, uh, go bankrupt within two years after finishing their careers. It is obvious that these people lack the financial skills to, uh, to keep their wealth and make it uh, bigger with time. Even though their median annual salary is one million and their average uh, pay per game is $35,000, they're not able to, uh, to keep that money and live off of that. So they're forced to find alternative careers after their sports career is over. The biggest problem at that point is that they have no other marketable skills with which they can be interesting uh, 
at the labor market. However, not everything is so bad. Uh, a lot of uh, players continue their careers even uh, past their sports uh, heights. Some of them live off of endorsements and uh, probably some of the best examples can be seen on this slide. Number one among uh, athletes is uh, Roger Federer, who is able to uh, generate $65 million. Uh, Next one is LeBron James. After that is Cristiano Ronaldo. Some of these players have been able to also capitalize on the social media bubble, which has been built in the past 10 uh, years. As we already said, Cristiano Ronaldo is the king of Instagram, Facebook, and all the other social media. He has a huge number of followers. Uh, right next to him is Neymar, and after that is uh, Leo Messi, meaning that these players are not only good at what they do, but they're very good at marketing their skills online. And the more uh, followers you generate, the more uh, profits you will be able to bring to your sponsors who back you up. So this is what endorsements do, and these are the sheer numbers in finance that tell you how much you're worth regardless of your sports talent. It's not just your sports talent at this point, but it's the amount of interest that you pull in the global media. There are also a lot of players who are world known and uh, were not able to manage well their careers after uh, the end of their sports career. The most important among them being Mike Tyson, for instance, or Dennis Rodman. So keep in mind, uh, no matter how much money you can earn, you can always spend more than what you've earned. This is why you need financial management in your careers. Thank you.